In your bio, I briefly explained your work as um, the CEO of Change in X, but you also work on Iraq Haven. Can you tell us a little bit what that's about? Sure, Iraq Haven is, um, is the idea to bring, it's, it's expeditionary economics, which was an article written by my friend Carl Schramm in, in Foreign Affairs in 2010, the idea of using economic uh, reform, particularly entrepreneurial dynamism, to stabilize post-conflict societies. And so uh, we work with uh, primarily Christians and Yazidis, but uh, minorities suffering from the ISIS genocide on the Nineveh Plain in northern Iraq. And our work has a public policy component, which is our proposal for a secured special economic zone, and a uh, kind of private sector networking component, which is to bring private sector companies to uh, create distribution channels to do technology transfer to mentor growth in companies that are there on the ground and then ultimately when that's working to do foreign direct investment. Uh, thanks. One of the more interesting examples that is perhaps a little bit related to this and also Michael's work on refugee cities, uh, Hong Kong, which is commonly used as an example for the importance of governance reforms. For example, it grew from a population of about 800,000 to a little over 2 million from 1946 to 51, which was largely refugees escaping the uh, Chinese Civil War and shows how with good governing institutions, it's possible to rapidly uh, incorporate uh, an extremely, a huge population growth. Um, and so I find the Iraq Haven project interesting because it is a little bit different from some of these other projects, which might be conceived of in a more traditional economic development notion, while this is more explicitly uh, rebuilding post-conflict societies. And so why do you view the special economic zone model as right for that? And what does it bring to the table to add to uh, other strategies of rebuilding post-conflict societies that might not be as successful as the special economic zone model might be? Well, I, I think... Uh the shortest answer was very elegantly art articulated by Tom in that graph that he put up in the first talk, which is that, um, you know, I mean, the fundamental problem with all these, yeah, there's conflict and there are people who like to shoot at each other and so forth, but the fundamental pro obstacle to economic growth and to investment and so forth is the rule of law, the lack of the rule of law. And, um, you know, our approach in, and I still all the time I'm on panels and stuff in DC with people who say, oh, you're, you're leaving the rest of the country, you're ignoring everybody, let's change the Iraqi constitution, let's da 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 da, you know, they wanna do what we've all wanted, you know, for decades there, and it just doesn't work. You can't reform a whole country all at once. But you know what, if it's a, an industrial park with guns, which is what I call our, our zone there, uh, you know, I mean, it's, like, it's just a, it's a little spot, and you can get away with a lot of reforms, and um, just as, you know, I, I forget who said it today, it was, it's a great analogy, China didn't take over Hong Kong, but in a way, Hong Kong took over China, um, and you know, by exporting its 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 rule of law. So I think you can do that. Um, I, I agree that you know, in Dominican Republic, there might there might be counterexamples where prudently zones wouldn't have been a good idea because they were just used as that safety valve. But that um, in most cases, the corruption that's there that's preventing the private sector economic activity that is really going to help the country. Um, is the way around it is to say, well, we're just gonna do these, this liberalization, economic liberalization right here in this little spot. And that makes enough people happy that you can, you know, you can do that. In Iraq, there's special problems in terms of security and so forth, so we've literally had to identify an army that can be redeployed to, to defend the zone and so forth and, and all that's working. But, um, so I think it's basically that. I, my, my sort of bumper sticker definition of a special economic zone is it's just a spot with a different set of rules. And you know, of the 4,000 um, special economic zones in the world, the majority of them fail because governments use them as just another example of the same cronyism and so on and so forth that's, that's stopping the country in the first place from developing properly. But that doesn't mean it isn't a good idea. It just means that, that whatever that set of rules is really matters. And I think maybe the most neglected of the seven things that make zones work rather than not work is the governance rights. You can't you know, Michael wants to go to the moon and put a special economic zone there. Um, you can't predict in advance, I assume, I can't, I'm not smart enough to predict in advance what special challenges there would be on the moon. But if, you have, if, if the governance rights are right, that who gets to decide is right, I have confidence that they'll figure it out. And if you 
you know, the dirigism problem or the knowledge problem of trying to predict in advance that urban planners, as I was used to be senior advisor to a HUD secretary, and all the urban planners I ever dealt with all wanted to tell everybody what to do all the time. And uh, the, the, the exception, uh, the, the one I've ever met, or, uh, was here today, right, who, who loves markets. But if you're trying to tell everybody what, what to do all the time. So anyway, I, I think that's why the model, even in a place like Iraq, especially in a place like Iraq, um, is going to work. Thanks. Uh, so for Michael, you've been working with Stephen on uh, some proposals for Iraq Haven, and you have this broader project of refugee cities. So I was wondering if you could comment, one, on how Iraq Haven fits into this broader model. And you touched on it in your talk, but perhaps comment a little bit more on refugee cities and how you see this sort of special economic zone, charter city model being able to tackle some of the challenges associated with the refugee crisis. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, we've uh, we've been kind of pushing forward the refugee city concept as sort of like a, a as just that a concept that can take many different forms and necessarily need should it takes many different forms because the context differs greatly in in different countries. So many countries like Iraq. Afghanistan and others, uh, obviously one of the pressing concerns is security, uh, both for, for companies, that, for, for attracting investment into the area, but also the people there uh, desperately need uh, security too. Uh, so figuring out the security component so that we can create sort of uh, indigenous you know, economic growth, organic, organic uh, economic growth happening from the bottom up from local entrepreneurs there requires security as well as a supporting legal framework. So that's, uh, so that's one of the things that uh, Stephen and I have, have been, been talking about quite a bit. Um, but in other areas, maybe the security isn't a major pressing issue, but it's other sort of business environment constraints uh, imposed by laws and stuff that, that, that the zones can, can operate in. And it can take many different physical forms too, either working with an existing refugee camp and giving it a special status and allowing economic growth there and, 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 and doing things that attract foreign investment into the camp can take an existing industrial park of some kind or existing special economic zone and then introducing a residential component that consists of both refugees and the host community into this area. Uh, it can be taking uh, empty land, I ideally that's sort of close to a population center because there'll be more demand there for, for uh, growth. Um, and it can go as big as like an entire city-sized area, ideally. The, um, having something the size of a mega city, I think, is very exciting and very, um, uh, there's a lot of potential in, in creating opportunities for just for more people and more, um, uh, more prosperity and inclusivity happening from an urban environment. Did that cover what you asked, sort of? OK. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And so you've been discussing, uh, Stephen, this special economic zone, a industrial park with security. Um, but I think your sort of long-term vision is a little bit bigger than that. You describe it in this email as a startup city. I've been using the term charter city because I think that emphasizes the importance of the governance aspect. So one, do you see a difference between those sort of terms and ideas? And then two, what is the staging process by which you see this industrial park with guns really growing into a, uh, this broader vision that can hopefully serve as revitalization combined with a, a, a demonstration of the importance of, of governance in economic development for the surrounding region? I don't see a, the first one's easy, I don't see a difference between startup cities or charter cities. Um, I, I think I, I use startup cities because most of the people I talk to don't realize the importance of a charter and, and a, you know, kind of constitutional law in the first place or anything else. And startup cities makes real clear, what's a charter city? I have no idea, right? You know, uh, could be San Francisco, but, but uh, startup city is real clear, so I, I just use that term. But I, I, I really respect you know, the charter cities movement and, um, but um, as long term, I mean, I, I think that, it, it, you know, um, obviously you'd like a bigger and bigger area. I think, I think there's a huge 
value starting with kind of a minimally viable product, the smallest possible area, because the mistake that we've made in nation building is that um, you, can, you, you can't really do it. You, I mean, it's very, you, you have to deal with all of the political obstacles at once and you make no progress at all. If you take your reforms down to the smallest possible level, and there is, it, it, it can't be just one room, right? I mean, it's, um, maybe it can, I'll let somebody else make that argument. But I, I think you need kind of the elements of a city there. Uh, you take it down to that element and you create, nothing sells like success. This is how, Shenzhen took over China, you know, the, the idea Hong Kong took over China in the sense that, you know, the, the, the revisionism that you hear now from the Chinese Communist Party, oh, we had this great idea and now look what it's done, um, isn't how it really happened. How it really happened was that um, these local business interests in Shenzhen, which was a little kind of fishing village, thing, you know, just a little podunk thing, I think with a population of 30,000 and now it's, you know, how many millions. But um, they were pushing and sort of lobbying through their Communist Party structure. Hey, we want a free trade zone. We want to do business with Hong Kong, and it's the only way this is going to work. It was sort of like a local chamber of commerce thing, just bugging and bugging. And even though it went against Communist Party principles, they, they have to deal with, you know, politi all politics is local. So they kind of got one. Uh, and then what made it take over the world? And then other people saw, hey, they got one. So other localities are kind of pushing and agitating through the normal process. And it's the, content, it's, it's, it's the content of what those rules were that happened to be the right, you know, the content matters. I think the governance rights gets you to the right content, but the content of those rules really does matter. And those happen to be really beneficial rules. And, you know, the per capita GDP of Shenzhen went up uh, it real, uh, in real terms, went up 40-fold in, in my lifetime, you know, between 70, whatever, you know, and to 2006. Um, you know, I mean, 80, 83 to 2006, 40-fold real increase. And so it's, it's that success that sold and why all the other zones were allowed, you know, other zones that were allowed for those same reasons. And then afterwards, China says, oh, gee, you know, more than half the people live in special zones now and, and way more than half the GDP comes from special zones. So, so the Communist Party says, see how smart we are? You know, we, we, we do these things. And you, you pay off politicians with credit. I'm fine for paying them with credit rather than other, other less uh, detrimental things. Thanks. I, I, I like the point you made relating to Shenzhen and how it was this local push. And somebody probably should have invited to speak. Lada Moberg makes this very eloquently in her book, The, the Political Economy of uh, Special Economic Zones. And I also appreciated, right, the real per capita GDP of Shenzhen rose about 40-fold. Just imagine what happened to the property values. <laughs> Um, it, it's actually very difficult to find urban land value prices time series. The one I have been able to find is Chicago, the first hundred years of Chicago's existence. Um, land values in Chicago rose about 30,000 fold. Uh, this is Bitcoin style returns over a longer period, but also right, Bitcoin returns are just insane. Um, and so, uh, go for it. Just a really interesting uh, side note about the land value increase in Shenzhen. This is, I think, a great model to a great lesson learned. So, you know, there's a few, you know, uh, a few ten thousand. Uh, so, I've heard estimates between like twenty thousand and three hundred thousand uh, fishing villagers who lived in the area of Shenzhen before it was designated as a zone. And so, exactly. So, so they. Uh, you know, under the Communist Party system, individuals can't own land. The state owns all the land, except in rural areas where villages are allowed to own land as sort of a village collective, right? So they, when they designated as a special economic zone, all of these fishing villagers were able to uh, have all hold land as a community. So they all formed landholding corporations that held title to pockets of, of Shenzhen around there. And each of the villagers became shareholders in this corporation. And so today they're like the wealthiest landowners in Shenzhen now because they, this mega city of 14 million people grew up around this tiny fishing village and about 10% of the land is held by, they now call them urban villages. And so because the people built, you know, residential towers and stuff on their, on their land and it makes tremendous amounts of money from, from rent from it. I'm going to add to that. I think it's a great idea. And I'm, I, I see my work fundamentally is, you know, 
sometimes I say creating jobs for poor people, but it's fundamentally about extending property rights to people who don't have them. And when Charlie and I were down working on the Special Economic Zone in Yucatan, uh, you came up with this proposal, it's still just a kind of a wild idea, but Yucatan has like the worst water in the world because the meteor that hit the, killed the dinosaurs landed there and it shot all these gas through the bedrock and everything and, and the soil is too porous to filter the water. So they have this really terrible, I mean, you, you can literally, you can smell the municipal water, it's so bad. I mean, it, it's terrible. And so everybody buys water from Walmart and big jugs, right? But, so, so, um, but the idea was, if you can align the interests of all of the, the, the people who have, they have bad water to do agriculture with, the, the poorest people in Yucatan, but if you collect that water, create like an RO plan or something, if you, you're essentially taking the water runoff from that that they're using, you give them back clean water, you, the people in the cities who don't have clean water, you sell it to them, and you take that money and you give it back to those farmers. So essentially you're saying you have a, you have a right. Now in Mexico, the legal, legal obstacle is the government owns all everything, right? But in terms of the water rights. But if you can use that politically to say, we're going to finance this RO plant, which you know, um, Yucatan desperately needs, through a private developer, because he's going to collect this watershed, and he's going to give you know, agricultural technology transfer, but he's gonna give the free water, give the water back, you know, to the, to the farmers so they can increase their agricultural output. So they get something for free. The people in the city aren't putting anything in, so what, they, ha they get to now pay their, their municipal water, but it's still gonna be cheaper than lugging jugs of water from Walmart. Uh, so so you, if you're using, using property rights as a way to say, all these folks, all these villages, because one of the objections that people often say is, you know, I got, an argument with this guy uh, works for the Vatican about, oh, you go down to Honduras and you put in a special economic zone and those people living next to the zone, they don't get anything out of it. And I'm like, well, they can go in the zone and get a job. Oh yeah, but not all of them can and it's not fair that they get to watch the, all that wealth be created right in front of them. Right. Well, well one way to answer that objection, I, I'm very irritated by the objection, but one way to answer the objection is to say, look, you, know, you, you figure out ways to use property rights to give local folks a stake in the increase in land values, and I'm, uh, I, I love that. I, I wasn't aware of that uh, of, of that thing about Shenzhen. I'm, I'm I'm happy to learn that today. Yeah, I think actually yesterday I was having a discussion with um, Noah Smith, and he recommended something a little bit similar along these lines, which is okay. You have this tremendous increase in land value. How do you compensate some of the potential losers, or how do you compensate? some of the people who might not benefit from these tremendous increases in productivity. And what he recommended was this idea of a social wealth, um, wealth fund, which uh, Matt Brunig, if you know him, has been pushing, sort of like what Norway and Alaska have, which can be used to make sure right, there is a minimum, um, there is a safety net for some of the people who might not be able to work or might not be productive, and can really be used to help some of the first movers potentially benefit to incentivize them to get involved at an early stage. And so I want to actually return to this point you made earlier, Stephen, regarding the, the sort of minimum viable product of a startup city or a charter city or a um, industrial park with security. So, right, this is, this is a complicated idea, but I think the idea is to create this, this minimum viable product where the growth potential is baked in. And so what does that really look like? What are the key elements? What does that ecosystem look like where you have a minimum viable product, but then you can also scale it very rapidly as it begins attracting more investment, as it begins expanding? And briefly before I pass the mic, one of the, I believe, underrated features of um, special economic zone or charter city legislation, which is in the Honduran legislation. I don't know of anywhere else in the world where it exists, but rather than designating an area of land to be a, um, to have the special jurisdiction, it says here is a process. And if you follow this process, then you become a special jurisdiction. And it's been implemented imperfectly in Honduras, um, but that allows for this natural built-in growth as well as for a greater variety of experiments. But now I'm rambling. so. What are the essential elements of a startup city ecosystem of the industrial park with security that can really be baked into scale up when um, that scaling time occurs? It's a really interesting question. You know, it reminds me, um, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to manage libertarians, but it's a thankless uh, process. And, and uh, I, I was a COO of an, 
uh, big organization with tons of libertarians and so forth, and I'm trying to get them to live in budgets and do all these things. They're like, oh, you're a government, you're a bureaucrat, you're all this, you know, you're trying to tell us what to do all the time. And, he's like, and you know, I tried to point out, unsuccessfully, tried to point out that, you know, Hayek, he's for planning. It just needs to exist at the, at the firm level, right? So central planning is a problem. Economies don't work without planning. And I think special economic zones, you know, the way to get them started and our, our secured special economic zone in Iraq, I mean, I'm in, you know, two weeks I'll be meeting with two cabinet ministers in Iraq about this idea of bringing uh, a particular investor, you know, a huge chemical plant basically that, that can, Iraq's buying gasoline every day, it'll lower the cost of gasoline in Iraq and so on and so forth. But, um, and instead of refining, it just builds it out of natural gas that they're throwing away. But the point is that without something like that, I'm also, you know, really want to bring in a chicken plant that'll revitalize all the farms that have been put out of business by the UN Oil for Food program where, you know, you couldn't make any money in farming in Iraq because the only thing they could legally do with their money was import chicken, you know. And, and so, the, 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 but the point is that those examples are, you have to find something that makes it work economically. You have to plant. Now, the single biggest mistake made with special economic zones, including the ones that, you know, when a country asks for them, like Iraq even asked for them, back, you know, at the Kuwait conference, they, they say, oh, well, we're going to make this zone over here, the petrochemical zone. We're going to make that zone the textile zone. Iraq actually asked for a small engine parts zone. Uh, okay. And I have nothing against small engine parts, right? But the idea that you can predict in advance uh, what the right investments are is wrong. It's the, it's the knowledge problem, right? So how do you overcome that dirigism? You know, you, you need to have flexibility so that the investors are risking in their capital. They can decide what they're going to bring to the zone. That's all true, and that's good economics. But, it, but also, you need to start with a first mover. You need to start with something where you do plan it out and you're like, hey, if this plant comes here and they create these jobs and it does that, we're gonna need these things. And you gotta make all that work. So it's gotta be economically viable. And that's how you ramp up into those other things. In Iraq, there are some specific targets of opportunity that not only do we have a couple of big possible first movers that can kind of bring everything else along with it, but you also have specific problems that create opportunities. So there's, you know, they've shut down all the, a lot of these refugee camps and there's still, even though they've turned off the electricity, there's still, you know, these um, uh, 250 families in Ankawa, for example, and they, they're trying to chase them all out of the plant. They go back to Mosul, go back to Mosul. And they're like, well, our neighbors turned us over to ISIS. We don't want to go back to Mosul. And they're just squatting there, even though they've turned off the electricity and everything else. The point is you can say, hey, we've got this special economic zone. We can put in a little village here and we can build 500 houses because, by the way, we're going to create 3,000 jobs at this one plant. So we're going to need more housing, even though there's lots of empty housing there, we're still going to need more housing. And so you can use that as an opportunity to say, we'll solve this political problem for you, which is an embarrassment. We'll create a village here. It makes them happy because, hey, my grandfather's from the end of a plane and I don't want to go back to Mosul. So you make, you make everybody happy. So it's just about, it, it, uh, you know, what you want a system. People are in government mostly because they like to tell everybody what to do. Uh, which is why a lot of these things fail. And so you have to buy them off in a way that allows them to save face by, you know, this, the public-private partnerships, one, one opportunity and so forth. But you have to leave room for success. And so I, I think it's just being opportunistic, identifying the things that can work, and then nothing sells like success. And, you know, you, you, you build it up from there. So our initial zone, which, um, you know, we're looking at a thousand donums, about one square mile, but there's an influence area and so forth, and there you can you, you'll be some housing, there will be some, you know, a couple of plants. But the real economic benefit for an, a special economic zone, in my view, is outside the zone. And what happens is integrating it with the local economy. And it's all, this, it's all those family farms around the zone where I think 15 times as many jobs are going to be created as are actually created uh, um, in the zone. So it's, it's mixing that thing of economic planning where you can find specific deals that are going to make it go and pay for the minimally viable product, but then not, you know, kind of getting in the fine print. So, okay, you want to call this the petrochemical zone or you want to call this the textile zone? Fine. That's what we did in Mexico is get in the fine print that, yeah, that Mexico's got these very clearly designed. There's a steel zone in Las Cardenas. There's an ICT zone in, in Yucatan and so on and so forth. But in the fine print, what it says is that the local board, the integral administrator and the public-private partnership that owns the zone can vote on allowing new industries into the zone. And that's all it takes. Because then when, it, when an investor comes and says, well, I know this is an ICT zone, but I want to bring, there's actually a case of a, of, a, of, a, of a food supplement company that wants to come to the Yucatan zone. And it's like, hey, guess what? In the fine print, you guys get to vote. Do you really want, do you want to accept this big investment or not? 
And the interest of the local board is going to be, well, hell yes, right? And so you, you got to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you're selling out. You know, that dirigism is a bad thing. You know, I, I get it. I get it. But you got to be practical about this and trust in people that as long as the decision rights are good, that you don't have to get the content of the rules correct. Because frankly, you can't. I mean, it's, I, I think I'm really smart. The rules I would pick are the best, trust me, right? But, you know, look, the reality is that only if the decision rights are right can those rules be changed and adapt and so forth. So, I, 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 anyway. Thank you. Um, so, we have about two minutes left, and I want to ask uh, one final question to Michael, because reading, for example, the special economic zone literature, if you look at the outcomes, most outcomes in special economic zones just aren't very good. And especially if you take out China, right, like special economic zones are neutral if slightly negative. There are a few really good examples outside China, but there's a lot of uh, white elephants. And so in your on the ground experience, Michael, what have you seen as sort of the cause of these white elephants? Do you think things are changing in a positive direction and what are the key things to avoid when, when thinking about creating special economic zones? Oh, right, yeah. The, if we're two types of zones, the traditional special economic zones that aren't, aren't very aggressive in terms of policy reforms, there the major factors are that whether a zone succeeds or fails is the location, picking a location in a, in a desirable area, um, not having, not, a, not making the planning framework overly restrictive so you're allowing a, a diversity of industries there. Um, normally the way you overcome those problems has been th that most zones that have overcome those problems have done so by having, um, the, putting the private sector in, in, in the lead in terms of finding, picking the location and applying for zones status for a location and allowing the private sector to finance and develop the whole zone. That way you're not wasting a lot of public funds and also not relying heavily on tax incentives to attract people to the zone because it's, the, the th zones become net negatives for a country when the government is shelling out a lot of money in terms of either tax incentives because it's revenue that they're not collecting or in terms of uh, putting a lot of money into infrastructure and they become colossal failures when you're in an area where nobody wants to go anyway. The, but the way to, the, probably the biggest factor if you can do it is to have a zone that has new rules, new institutions, new, new governing authorities. So you have new policies that can reduce some of the things that are keeping out economic growth from happening. That has explosive potential and can probably, uh, probably cover over a host of other sins um, it, for, for zones. Uh, and I think the positive trend that you asked is is zones that are doing more of that type of thing, that are moving in the direction of legal policy reforms and new administrations to, to implement those reforms. Great. Uh, thanks, guys.